Hello, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over return on equity. Uh, return on equity is arguably one of the most used and uh, most most referenced and most important financial ratio. Um, this is true. The ROE is important to management as well as to investors. Um, just a nomenclature, uh, you may heard of um, ROCE, return on common share shareholders equity. Um, the two terms are interchangeable. Um, if you are working with a public company, definitely ROCE, common stockholder equity. Uh, whereas if you work or if you are working on or for on a private firm or for a private firm, then return on equity ROE um, or common equity. So the important thing here is that ROE typically do not take into account preferred stocks. We just finished looking at ROA, return on asset, um, where we take out all the financing costs. Um, and we emphasize that one of the important characteristics of ROA is that it's not affected by the, how the firm is financed, whether it is using equity or, or uh, liabilities. Uh, ROE is exactly the opposite. ROE is affected by the capital structure that the firm chooses, meaning that how, what, how much the firm uses debt versus equity. So since we are focused on common equity, the net income we use is net income available to common shareholder. And of course, the denominator is um, average common shareholders equity. Similar to ROA, we can also disaggregate ROE into individual components. So remember with ROA, we have two, profit margin and total asset turnover. With ROE, we have one more component, and the component has to do with the capital structure of the firm. Here are the three components of ROE. So the first is profit margin, and this in here, profit margin is um, defined as profit margin for ROE. And what that means is we take net income available to common stockholders. So remember profit margin, when we compute profit margin for ROA, we're looking at net income plus any financing expenses. Uh, for ROE, we take net income available to common stockholders, which is net income after all finances except common stockholder dividend, right? So any interest, any preferred dividend would have been taken out. And that is the, and the ROE, return on equity, is net income available common stockholder divided by average common stockholder equity. The three decomposition is profit margin. So again, the numerator is the same, is net income available to common stockholders divided by sales. And the second component is asset turnover. Asset turnover is actually computed the same way as ROA, is sales divided by total assets. And then the final component is equity multiplier. Equity multiplier, um, there are many names for this. Um, the important thing to remember is that it represents the capital structure leverage. So let's take a look at what it does and why do we call it uh, equity multiplier. We take total asset divided by common stockholder equity. So let's take an example. If let's say total asset is two, and common shareholder is 1.5. So that means is for every $1.50 you put in as equity, you will borrow 50 cents so that you can acquire $2 worth of total asset. And that's why sometimes the term multiply is used. So for every dollar you put in, you, they'll enable the company to borrow money based on its capital structure. And that leverage allows you to purchase more total assets. So that's why it's called um, capital structure leverage or equity multiplier. And then finally, of course, I want you to notice that these terms cancel out. So sales will cancel out with sales and total asset will cancel out with total asset. So if you cancel all the terms, you will get back the um, your original form. So if this is cancel out, and this is cancel out, you get back net income available to common stockholder divided by average common holders share, share equity. So the two obviously are the same. 
um, is just a decomposition. So you should not change the calculation. But by decomposing, we get more information. Now let us take a look at an example. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to pause the video and download the template so that you can go along um, with this example. So unlike the last example, this is more this example we are using raw data that we extracted from the financial statements. So for income statement item, this is the sales for the year uh, five. So this is the annual in uh, sales and for balance sheet items, um, these are year end items. So if we are using the average, we have to compute the average. So for example, um, average total asset for year three will be the ending balance of year three plus the ending balance of year two divided by two. So um, this is raw data. So once again, if you have not done so, please pause the video and download the, um, the template. So here are some suggestions on how to work with um, financial models in Excel to help you calculate um, the necessary ratios. So first, um, as I suggested, you can compute intermediate values. Instead of putting in very, very long formulas in Excel, um, my preference and also um, the uh, good um, modeling technique suggests that we uh, we put all the intermediate calculation explicitly into the model um, so that somebody else, including yourself, six months from now, can go look at the model and easily understand how, uh, what calculations were involved and um, follow the model. And, and also, if you do end up making a mistake, it's much easier to go back and identify where the errors come from if you don't have very, very long and complex formulas in Excel. Another thing about using Excel is that you want to be careful about rounding. Rounding is different than display. So if you change the display setting for uh, to show only two decimal places, the, the, the remaining decimal places are still being used in future calculations. So if you are checking your calculation by hand against an Excel model, uh, they, you may be off by pennies or even dollars because of rounding. So there are ways you can get around that. Um, so it's a choice between precision versus representation. So what do we mean by intermediate values? Let's take a look at our specific example. Uh, we are going to compute ROA and ROE. So there are a few things that, that we need. First of all, we know we need average values for asset equity uh, and so forth. So we need, we need to compute averages. Second, when we compute ROA, we need net income from asset. And we know the, the formula for net income, from, net income from assets is we take net income available to stockholders plus, so add back the after-tax interest expense. So we have done that um, a number of times. And net income available to common shareholders is typically net income minus preferred dividend. So uh, depending on what information we are given, um, we need to make those adjustments. Here we have the template in Excel. So we're going to go through our calculation. Remember, the first thing we're going to do is to put in the um, the intermediate value. So we have two. Uh, one is the average. Um, so again, the average is equal to the sum of the two ending balances divided by two. So once we created one formula, um, we know the rest is the same, so we can just copy it. And notice that I arranged the averages in the same order as the in the template, so that that makes copying a lot easier. And if you see this sign, that means the column width is too narrow, so we can just expand the column width. So now we have the averages. 
To compute net income from assets, we need to take net income plus after tax interest expense. So we need to do one minus the tax rate. And the tax rate here is display. So it's 35%. So net income from asset is net income plus one minus income tax times interest expense. And this is my preferred way to enter a formula. I will walk you through. Uh, if you're not if you are not familiar with this, it's much more accurate and easier to do than trying to identify the um, the cell reference or the cell address. So I oftentimes start my formula with an equal sign, and then I click on the first item, which is net income. Next, I type in the operator. So in this case, the operator is addition, so plus. So enter the plus sign. And the next operator is in a bracket. We need to do uh, bracket one minus. So you start with the open bracket and then one minus. Now we click on the cell that contains the tax rate. Close parenthesis and enter your next operator, which is multiply. And then click on the cell that contains interest expense. So by entering a formula this way, it's much less likely to make um, a mistake by typing in the wrong cell address. So to complete the formula, I simply enter it. And once we have created the formula correctly, we can simply copy it over. And once we have um, computed the intermediate value and the net income, we can do um, return on asset analysis. So first, let's compute ROA, the simple or traditional way, which is net income from assets. When, so once again, I'm gonna start with the equal sign, equals the net income from asset divided, so enter the operator, divide by uh, total asset. So that give us the um, ROA. So notice how many decimal places are here. Um, you can simply change the number of decimal places. You can change the format to a percentage. Um, either, uh, whichever format works for you will be fine. Um, but this, remember, the decimal places are simply um, formatted away, it's still there. So if you increase the decimal places, it will remain. If you want to round this off so that the decimal places are not carried in future calculation, you have to use the round function in Excel. So if you just round, you can round to four decimal places. So if you do that, then no matter how many decimal places you display, it has been rounded off. Um, it depends on your calculation whether or not you want it to be rounded off or if you want to keep all the decimal places so that uh, future calculation will be accurate um, without all the precision is not reduced um, for future calculations. Another consideration when you work in a company is company policy. Uh, typically, a well-designed company would have policy that specify whether or not you do intermediate rounding, and if you do, how many decimal places do you carry through? Uh, for the purpose of um, uh, a, a homework exercise, as you notice, the homework typically say, do not do any intermediate rounding. If it says, do not do any intermediate rounding, then means make sure you don't round in the intermediate calculation. Okay, so in our ROA uh, analysis, we computed the, the, uh, the basic ROA. And remember that we can decompose it into two components. We can decompose it into the profit margin for ROA and also the total assets turnover. And profit margin for ROA is defined as net income from assets divided by sales. So once again, we don't have to compute averages for sales because that's from the income statement.
and total asset turnover is sales divided by average total asset. And I, I usually change my um, decimal places before I copy because that way when I do the copying, um, I have all the format already in place. So once I created the calculation for one year, I can simply copy it over to the other years. So in here, you can see that profit margin from, for um, JCPenney changes um, quite a bit. Um, there is a significant decline in year four. Um, turnover is relatively stable. It is actually improving. It is possible that um, they are reducing assets in response to um, losses. So we can take a look and see if that's the case. And indeed it is. The company has been reducing its assets. So by reducing assets re in response to their losses, they are able to increase their total asset turnover. Next, we're going to compute uh, ROE. But before we can do that, we first have to compute net income available to common stockholders. And remember that will be net income minus preferred dividends. So we have net income in year five for 524 minus dividend, preferred dividend of 12 in year five. So that gives us net income available to common stockholders. And we can copy that to the next two years. Now let's do ROE analysis. So first let's compute ROE. So ROE is income available to common shareholders divided by average common shareholders equity. And then next we're going to compute um, the three components. Remember the first is profit margin for ROE. Next is total assets turnover. And then we have um, equity multiplier or capital structure leverage. Okay. So profit margin is net income available to common shareholders divided by sales. And total asset turnover, the calculation is the same. It is sales divided by average total asset. And then finally, the equity multiplier is average total asset divided by average common holders equity. So now as we have um, all three components calculated, you can also double check. Of course, total asset turnover is total asset turnover. You get the same number under either calculation. And we can copy this to the next few years. Now you can always check your work. Remember this is a comp decomposition. So when we multiply those two, we should get back our ROA. And when we multiply these three, we should get back ROE. So let's do a check to see. So I'm going to insert a row here. I'm going to call this ROA check. So if I multiply profit margin by total, total asset turnover, I should get the same as my original calculation. And indeed, of course, they all do. We can do the same thing here. We can put in our E check. And so we multiply profit margin by total asset turnover by equity multiplier. And of course, not surprisingly, we get back ROE. So we can do that for all three years. And we can do the check for all three years. Next, we're going to take a deeper look at, so how does each capital structure contribute to the profitability of the firm? So what we're going to do is we're going to break down, um, complete the capital structure for um, equity, which includes preferred stock and common stock. And we're going to add one more line. We're going to also add in liability. So let me put an extra line in here. So remember, so total liabilities. Remember the fundamental accounting equation is that total asset is equal to 
uh, preferred stock, common stock, and liabilities. So to compute liabilities, we simply subtract preferred stock and common equity from total asset. So we take total asset minus preferred stock and minus common holders equity. So that is our liability for the years. And, we go, and we're going to add, so again, insert a line here. We're going to compute the average total liabilities. And in fact, we could have just copied the formula, but we created that formula a while ago. So just to be safe, we're computing the average liability. So now we have preferred stock, common stock, and total liability. And we can then um, look at how does each of these items contribute to the um, profitability of the firm. Remember that ROA is the return on assets that is unaffected by the use of leverage. So we can look at the income that is, that is generated from the amount that we invested um, through liabilities before any interest expense. So I'm going to call these net income from invested liabilities before interest expense. One way to look at this is that we invested $11,073 on average that year, uh, and we generated a return of 4.35%. So to translate that into a dollar amount, we take the 4.35% times the $11,073 in liability that I invested. So the firm would have gener generated $481.72 uh, from the $11,073 that you invested. So this is income inv from the $11,073 before interest expense. So now we have to then subtract from it after tax interest expense. So remember to compute after tax, we need to take one minus the tax rate and our tax rate is 35% times the interest expense, which is $279. So that's our interest expense. And if we subtract these two, what is remaining is net income that is available to common stockholders from our invested liability. So what that means is uh, the $11,073 generated 4.35%, which is $481.72. However, we have to pay $181.35 to the liability holders in the form of after tax interest expense. So what remain is $337 that is available to common stockholders. Next, we're going to do the similar calculation for preferred stock. So we're going to compute net income from invested preferred stock. And again, we're going to do that before dividend. And be very careful, that's preferred dividends. So we have preferred stock of 152. So we take 152 times 4.35%. So we're going to generate 4.35% from that. And then we have preferred dividend. We don't have to worry about tax because preferred dividend is after tax. So we pay $12 in preferred dividend. And so out of the, so the net income available to common equity from the invested preferred stock is the difference between the two. So in this case, our preferred dividend is so high that we're actually subsidizing the preferred stockholders. We, we didn't generate sufficient return or income to pay the $12 that we need to pay preferred stockholder. And then the last item, so we have liability, we have preferred stock, the last item is 
common shareholders. So this is net income from invested common equity. So our common equity is $4,988.50 times the ROA of 4.35%. So we generated 4.35% on 49.8850. So that's how much um, the income from directly coming from the common equity that is invested. Now, if we add up the three, so if you add up all this, so this is the total net income from invested both liabilities and prefer equity and common equity. We'll get back what we started with. So net of expenses, so $337. Um, net, net of dividends is negative $5.39 plus common equity. So we have $512. And not surprising, that is the same $512 of net income available to common shareholders that we have. Uh, once we confirm that we did the calculation correct for one year, we can copy it over to the other years. And we will see that, yes, indeed, all of this check out. So this calculation is useful because it helps us understand um, where the return and expenses come from. So our uh, return ROA that is not affected from leverage, um, we're able to generate this amount of net income based on the liabilities that we have, based on preferred stock we have, and based on common stock we have. We subtract from it um, expenses associated with each of these capital structure. So for liabilities, we subtract after-tax interest expense. For preferred stock, we subtract preferred dividend. So to compute this net income, we simply take ROA. So it's important to use ROA, not ROE. We take ROA times the um, respective average value that is in each type of capital structure. So liability, preferred stock, and common stock. And we see uh, how each of them contributed. So for common stock, it's actually a negative contribution. For uh, liabilities, as long as the company is making money, it is contributing. So to summarize, by computing this ratio, we'll be able to understand the impact of different kinds of risk, um, whether or not the risk comes from the business, the operating characteristic, and of course, um, when you look at ROE, the financial risk that we take on by using liabilities in our capital structure. So just um, a reminder, economic and strategic factor. So this, will, uh, this depends on the product life cycle, we'll typically see a um, much higher cash outflow and also slightly higher profit margin uh, when there are fewer competitors. Um, how cyclical a particular business is, the industry. So an industry that's more cyclical means that it will increase and fall along with the business cycle. So they will have a higher variability and higher risk. Um, and then operating leverage, that is the degree of fixed cost relative to um, the firm. So to understand uh, the cyclicality, we can look at year to year change in a firm. Um, and to look at operating leverage, we can look at the expense ratio. Return on asset is affected by both business and operating risk. And then finally, the use of capital structure will affect the financial risk of the firm. So higher debt ratio, higher interest expense ratio increases the financial risk. And then ROE is affected by all three, business operating as well as financial risk. This concludes the um, lecture for this chapter, and I will see you soon in the following chapter.